In this final lecture of our vascular ultrasound module, we're going to look at the use of POCUS to evaluate a patient for deep vein thrombosis. This indication was one of the first uses of point of care technology and has continued to be one of the most common reasons to reach for an ultrasound probe in the inpatient wards and emergency department. My hope is that you'll consider adding this to your outpatient management as well to prevent unnecessary hospital visits and ER bills. I should note that we will only be discussing lower extremity proximal DVTs in this video. If you're in a setting where you'll need to know how to evaluate for upper extremity or distal DVTs, the concepts will be the same, but the anatomy will be different, and I can point you to some resources uh, to be helpful for you in the future. Our probe of choice for this exam is going to be the high frequency linear probe. However, some patients with a larger habitus or very deep veins may require switching over to the curvilinear probe for adequate visualization. To position a patient for this exam, expose the patient from the inguinal crease to the mid calf and ask them to bend their knee out to the side, kind of like a frog leg position. It's often helpful to roll a small towel or place a pillow under the patient's knee or thigh to help with positioning and reduce discomfort. The probe indicator marker should be oriented towards the patient's right side, parallel to the inguinal crease, intending to catch the vessels transversely. As we start to think about locating DVTs, take a moment to ask yourself, where in the vascular tree do most DVTs occur? Recall that the idea of Virchow's triad links clot formation with three interrelated factors. Firstly, the intrinsic propensity for the blood to clot, based on genetic or cellular or biochemical properties, which is referred to as the blood's coagulability. I'm sure you can think of a couple conditions that predispose patients to developing thrombi, such as antiphospholipid syndrome, factor V Leiden, or protein C or S deficiency. Those factors are not as easily altered as the other two, which we'll focus on today. Firstly, stasis, or the relative lack of flow, promotes coagulation by allowing for clotting factors to come into closer contact with each other, where they can begin to outcompete with anticoagulant processes. And then secondly, endothelial injury, which releases procoagulation enzymes and signals, which promote formation of clots. Let's take a moment to look at how venous anatomy and physiology can promote clot formation. Recall that veins are made up of one-way valves that prevent excessive reflux of blood due to gravity. The motion of the body and hemodynamics of the cardiac cycle promote the forward motion of blood through these valves towards the heart. It's tempting to think of blood flow in veins being similar to that of arteries in a relatively uniform or laminar matter, but the reality is slightly less ordered. When blood moves in venous circulation, the valves themselves can sometimes create small eddies in the valve sinuses. As these eddies promote a relative amount of stasis, this can predispose patients to having clot formation in these valve sinuses. Additionally, as the eddies remain, the valve sinuses sort of get well, choked out. They start to absorb the oxygen from these pockets, resulting in an ever so slight hypoxia in these areas, which can predispose them to endothelial injury. So we have both endothelial injury and stasis being more likely in these valve sinuses, and thus the opportunity to form clots becomes more likely as well. Similar processes can also occur at vein junctions, and this is why we often look at major venous confluences when investigating for DVTs. The lower extremity vascular structure of interest to our DVT exam is sketched out here. The common endpoint for venous return of the lower extremity is the iliac vein, which will join with its contralateral partner to form the inferior vena cava. The iliac vein is an extension of the common femoral vein, identified below the inguinal ligament and the proximal thigh. A large tributary of the common femoral vein is the greater saphenous vein, which will join with the common femoral vein proximally in the leg. As we trace the vein distally and upstream towards the feet, we will sometimes see a lateral perforator vein that comes out to the side, and then a deep femoral vein that branches after coursing deep in the leg close to the femur. The deep femoral vein will be seen joining the femoral vein, or sometimes called the superficial femoral vein. This is a common naming issue. Um, 
more proximally in the leg. And then as we trace the venous tree again upstream, we will eventually reach the popliteal vein, itself formed by a confluence of the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and perineal veins as either a two or three vessel conjunction. Veins can be visualized using standard B-mode ultrasound or by using color Doppler. Just remember that the colors respond to flows towards the probe as red and away from the probe as blue, not to arteries or veins specifically. To assess for thrombi, which will often appear anechoic and be difficult to visualize inside the vessel lumen, we instead indirectly look for thrombus by pushing on the vein with our transducer and observing the vein collapsing while the adjacent artery, if there is one, remains patent. In general, Veins will lie deep to arteries, with the notable exception of the popliteal vein, which pops to the top. Here we can see an example of the femoral vein being compressed with the transducer. In the left image, the vein is easily visualized being compressed by the transducer. It would be considered a negative test at that location. On the right, however, we can see that the femoral vein is unable to be collapsed by pressure from the transducer, thus signifying the presence of a clot in the vessel. Now, how much of the leg do we really have to look at for being confident that there is or isn't a DVT present? Well, several studies have been tied to answer that question without a perfect consensus. The most common four protocols described in the POCUS literature are, one, the two-point compression ultrasound, which looks at the greater saphenous junction and the popliteal area. Two, the extended compression ultrasound, which looks at the entirety of the deep vasculature from the inguinal ligament to the popliteal fossa, compressing every couple of centimeters along the way. The third way, a complete compression ultrasound, looks all the way down into the distal leg, again, taking pictures every couple centimeters or so, and this is often the type of exam done when we order a formal venous ultrasound. Lastly, there's something called a complete Doppler ultrasound, which adds Doppler investigation of the areas most commonly affected by clots to a complete compression ultrasound. So once again, this is the two-point compression, the extended compression, complete compression, and complete Doppler ultrasound. So which one's best? Well, the jury is still out. Some studies have shown that two-point compression ultrasound can achieve comparable rates of detection of large proximal DVTs as those done by formal radiology studies. However, there are some design challenges in some of these studies and the results are not always reproducible, which gives me some pause when I'm teaching this exam to others. For our own standard here at Waco Family Medicine, my guidance is to follow the AHA guidelines, which recommend extended compression ultrasound as the protocol of choice when using POCUS in settings where formal scans are unavailable or not immediately available and waiting to, uh, for a formal scan would result in a longer decision to treat time. For this reason, the extended compression ultrasound protocol is the one that I will be modeling for you and expect you to complete during your skills checkoffs. The extended compression ultrasound protocol involves compressing the deep venous tree from the inguinal crease to the popliteal fossa every couple of centimeters and also capturing images of any areas of non-compressibility as well as saving images at key locations. Namely, we should capture images of the vein and its compressibility at the common femoral vein, the takeoff of the greater saphenous vein, at the level of the lateral peripheral vein, if we visualize it, at the joining of the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein, and at the confluence of the popliteal vein. These areas are the most commonly implicated in DVT formation and thus represent the minimum documentation requirements to show with high likelihood that there is not a DVD present in the image leg. The image on the right, taken from the point of care ultrasound text by Sony and others, is one that I really like. In general, it reminds us that the veins in the lower extremity will run medially or deep to the arteries, with the notable exception of the popliteal vein. Let's take a look at some example images. Here's a view of the common femoral vein. We can see from our footprint that we're using the linear probe with a depth set to six centimeters. Deep to the soft tissue and musculature, we see a pair of anechoic round structures that represent the common femoral vein and artery. With compression, they do not compress. This is diagnostic of a proximal deep vein thrombosis, and this patient should be evaluated for anticoagulation or referred to IVC filter placement. Here's that same patient now with the addition of color Doppler signal. 
we can see that there's rapid pulsatile flow in the artery, and only a small portion of the vein exhibits flow. In both cases, we see some aliasing artifact. Again, this is a DVT. It needs to be further uh, treated, and the history surrounding its formation should be explored to see if this is a provoked or unprovoked DVT, and see if the patient is a candidate for anticoagulation therapy and for how long they should remain on that therapy. Here's an example of a popliteal deep vein thrombosis. Remember that in the popliteal fossa, the vein will be located more superficially than the artery. Although with sufficient pressure, we can approximate the walls of the popliteal artery, we can still see its pulsatile nature and color flow could confirm that indeed, that is the artery. Now this is a common area where learners fail to recognize DVTs, which in this case is seen by the lack of compressibility in the more superficial popliteal vein. It's tricky, which is why I keep on emphasizing the pop to the top mnemonic. Now, there are also some findings that can mimic non-compressible vasculature and thus be falsely diagnosed as a DVT. On the upper left image, we do in fact see a non-compressible vessel, but this is actually a superficial vessel, and this is superficial thrombophlebitis. Typically, management would consist of supportive care, warm compresses, and monitoring, rather than jumping to anticoagulation straight away, although this will depend some on the patient and the provider preferences to a certain degree. On the upper right image, we see a Baker's cyst, which we can identify by the fluid that tracks, um, or it doesn't have any internal flow on color flow, and it's uh, tracking with a connection to the joint space between the semimembranosus tendon and the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. The bottom left image shows a hypoechoic inguinal mass, which is probably a hematoma, doesn't really say for sure what it is. And while this one is quite large, you can see how a smaller one may mimic a DVT, and so it's important that you trace your findings proximally and distally to determine that indeed the area that you're looking at that's non-compressible is a vessel and not some cyst or mass that might be in the area. And then lastly, the bottom right picture shows a lymph node, which we can see has the typical architecture of a hypoechoic cortex with a hyper or isoechoic hilum on the inside. Remember that lymphatic systems often run near vessels and so can be mistaken for DVTs. However, I'm confident you can avoid being tripped up by these mimickers if you follow the ECUS protocol we've discussed in this lecture. Let's end this module with a review of the evidence that supports use of point of care ultrasound for the detection of DVTs. Several organizations such as CHEST and the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound have put out statements in support of POCUS's use for diagnosing DVT, largely because multiple studies have shown high sensitivities and specificities, above 90% each, in both the emergency room and the inpatient settings. While fewer studies have been conducted in the ambulatory outpatient settings, those that have seem consistent with these results thus far. In addition to purely diagnostic use, several patient-centered outcomes have been linked to POCUS use as well, including a decreased ER length of stay, increased patient satisfaction with their care, decreased time to initiation of treatment, and lower costs for patients who receive POCUS scans. Additionally, there have been several studies that have shown that medical residents, advanced practice providers, and even inexperienced POCUS users can quickly attain sufficient training with little investment of time and consistently reach high levels of confidence in their exam findings after just a handful of real or simulated patient encounters. And with that, we finished our module on vascular ultrasound. I hope you've been interested by the unique ways that Doppler technology can grant us some insight into the conditions that our patients may be affected by and uh, have some interest in exploring this modality as you progress in your POCUS knowledge.